you would grab a Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13, that's where we'll begin this period of study. Matthew chapter 13. Good to see you this morning. We have a number of visitors with us. Thank you for being here, for making the effort, taking the time. Whether you're traveling or whether you're from the community, you have taken this time to come and pursue the things of God, open the Word of God, and to worship God with us. And it is an encouragement to us that you are here, and we want to be an encouragement to you. Please let us know if there's something we can do to help you or something you have a question about that we do. Uh, anything like that, we'd love to engage with you more about that. But thank you most of all for being here. Matthew chapter 13, I want to begin by reading in verse 40. Matthew 13 and verse 40. Jesus says, in explaining the parable of the tares, Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. So as he closes this story of the parable of the wheat and the tares, he talks about how there will be an ultimate separation, what he calls at the end of the age. And he uses several images to describe what happens to those who he calls lawbreakers. He says that like weeds are gathered and burned with fire, they will be thrown into the fiery furnace. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And we tend to scoot right by that, don't we? We don't want to focus on those pictures and images because they are unpleasant and they are unpopular. And what I mean by that is that non-Christians don't want to talk about that because it seems very judgmental, because after all it is about judgment. And it's something that we don't really want to think about, the idea that, that people might be lost or be punished eternally. That's an unpleasant thought. But I also mean that Christians often scoot by pictures and discussion of judgment. It just seems maybe impolite. It's something that we just don't like to give a lot of airtime to. And it seems odd to me because we preach very often about how God is loving and gracious and He wants to save us. But there seems to be very little understanding of what God wants to save us from. If God is saving us, if Jesus died to redeem us and buy us back from something, then it seems worth our while, in my view, to just every once in a while think about what it is that we would suffer were it not for the intervention of Jesus. So what I want to do for a few minutes this morning is ask the question, what did Jesus believe about hell? The problem, of course, is that if just because we don't like something doesn't mean we should live in denial about it. If we don't like the teaching about hell or the idea of hell, it doesn't change it. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It doesn't mean it's not still awaiting those who God deems as wicked. It seems to me that the main thrust of Scripture is that the teaching about hell is given not simply to frighten us, but to motivate us to a richer service of God. And if we ignore it, then we lose that motivation. So I want to take some time and answer this question. What did Jesus believe about hell? Particularly, I'm interested in the fact. Don't you find this intriguing? Nobody talks about hell more than Jesus. In fact, it's not even close. There are very few references to hell at all outside of Jesus' teachings. And it is very odd to me because the modern perception of who Jesus is and the way Jesus taught would say that Jesus would never say anything about something so unpleasant. Jesus was always kind and patient and warm and, and optimistic and positive. Jesus would never say something like what we just read Jesus said. So it seems to me that we have created a caricature of Jesus who would never teach what Jesus actually taught. Whereas, it seems to me that if Jesus came from heaven and bears witness to heavenly truths and he tells us about a horrible fate that might await us, that we need to listen to it and pay attention to it. I want to say something before I get started. Uh, Daniel's here and was leading our singing. I'm, I'm glad that already he's tired of being in northwest Arkansas and wants to come back. Um, I was talking to Daniel yesterday. He asked me the question, what, what are you preaching on tomorrow? I'm leading singing. And I said, hell, which to me may be the worst topic to sing about ever. I, I just don't know what could be worse. 
And Dan, I, he did a great job with that. I can't even believe we had a great song service. And he did an awesome job. So I, just, I don't see where you are, but I just want to tell him that's, that's awesome. I really appreciate that. Uh, the song leaders always try to do that, but sometimes are easier than others. And uh, today was a difficult one. I appreciate that. So let's talk about it. What did Jesus believe about hell? Let's take a minute and just look through Jesus' teachings about this. The first thing I would say is that Jesus says that judgment is coming. So you see that here in Matthew chapter 13. Now, I want to remind you, this is what prophets often said in the Old Testament. Prophets would often come and say, God is going to judge. Judgment is coming. Watch out. Straighten up. Prepare for God because God is coming and judgment is coming with him. So the goal when the prophets would speak about judgment was to get the people to repent so that they did not experience the judgment that was coming. And in the very same way, Jesus comes telling us judgment is coming. So in this story, Jesus has been picturing the kingdom as wheat and weeds together. And he says, we're not going to separate the wheat and the weeds now. We're going to let them both grow together until the end of the age. And at the end of the age, then there will be a separation. And then there will be the punishment or the burning or however you want to describe it. In verse 40, just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all causes of sin and lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So there is judgment coming, and by that we mean really separation between those who are evildoers and those who belong to God. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Those are just horrible images that are images of regret and torment, of pain. They describe suffering. And He also uses the image of a fiery furnace, There in verse 42, he also uses that same image a little later when he talks about the dragnet in verse 50, where he is saying this is something that's a part of the parable, but it also describes a judgment that is coming. But since you read a a story like this and you say, well, that's a parable, it's kind of hard to get concrete facts about hell from a story like that. You can just see, okay, there's some general tones of judgment and unpleasantness. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 3 for a moment. In Matthew 3... So this is describing John the Baptist who precedes Jesus, although Jesus and John certainly endorse one another's message. In fact, you might say that John and Jesus preach the same message with Jesus' message just a little more mature. John preaches that one is coming after me, and Jesus preaches I am that one. John preaches the kingdom of heaven is here or is coming, and Jesus preaches the kingdom of heaven is here. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 7. It says, but when he, this is John, saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So, John's message is that judgment is coming. I don't know if you caught that. In several different ways he says that. In verse 7 he says, Who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? The wrath of God that's coming. And then he talks about, in verse 10, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. That is, the tree is going to be cut down. And so you be careful, because if you're the tree, you don't want to be a part of that judgment that is coming. And he says, those who are not doing God's will, he says, are going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. They don't bear good fruit. And then he talks about Jesus. And he says, you know, I baptize you with water, but the one who is coming is going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. And then he also says, look again at verse 12, His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So the picture here is as of a, think of a pitchfork, we would say, where the the farmer would get the wheat with all the chaff in it, and he would sift it and throw it up in the air, and the chaff would float, and the wheat would sink. So you you move out the, the wheat from the chaff, you take the wheat, you put it in the barn, but you burn the chaff. It's not good for anything. So... He is saying Jesus is going to come with his winnowing fork, and he's going to separate. He's going to separate the good from the evil, the fruitful from the unfruitful. And he is going to burn, he says, with unquenchable fire those who are not found to be faithful to God. So this is a warning. Judgment is coming. It's time to repent. So while John, please hear me, 
While John the Baptist pictures Jesus as the Lamb of God come to take away the sin of the world, he also pictures Jesus as the farmer who's come to separate the wheat from the chaff. Both of those pictures are from John's mouth, and they work together to give us a full picture of how Jesus is going to come. And it will be a blessing for some, but for others it will not be so good because they refuse to repent and to follow God. Turn the page to Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, here Jesus is teaching about anger. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 21, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So Jesus is teaching here that anger is the gateway to murder. It is to be judged in the same way that murder is. Did you catch that? It is to be judged in the same way murder is. Judged by man and judged by God. It is not only murderers who will be subject to judgment. And when he talks about anger in verse 22, whoever is angry with his brother, it seems to me that he's talking about ongoing anger. Anger that we don't resolve. Anger that leads us to do things we shouldn't do. Like call people names and say ugly things about them. So when Jesus says, when we are angry in this way and we refuse to temper our anger, we refuse to calm down, then he says we will face judgment, both here on earth and from God at the end of the age. Did you catch it in verse 22? You see the escalation. Everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. What I want you to see here is that Jesus talks about hell as real, hell as a consequence of for evil behavior, and hell as a part of God's righteous judgment. In fact, judgment, counsel, and hell are all synonyms in this text because he is saying this is part of how God is going to judge. This is Matthew chapter 8 and verse 11. He, Jesus says, I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So here Jesus is saying there is judgment coming on those who believe they're a part of the kingdom but refuse to obey God. And he says that judgment is going to involve the outer darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we're going to talk more later about some other pictures Jesus uses with the sheep and the goats and the separation that happens with them. But you get the point. Judgment is coming. And I especially want to emphasize when you read judgment, what is being taught is that there is a separation. God is going to make a distinction between two kinds of people or groups of people. We are either going to receive a final blessing or a final condemnation. And then we will be with others who have received the same fate that we have. Now the demons know that too. And we see the demons as they encounter Jesus saying things like, Have you come to torment us before the time? Or please don't send us into the abyss. And the idea is they know judgment is coming. They just hope it's not yet. But the message of the gospel is judgment is coming. So sometimes when Jesus describes that judgment, I want to say this just in case you're uh, paying careful attention here. Sometimes that can mean a judgment that's going to happen soon, as in in time. Sometimes that happens where there are judgments, I believe in Matthew 24, where he describes the destruction of Jerusalem. A lot of that reads that way. A judgment that's not the end of the world, but a judgment that's going to happen as an army comes and destroys the city of Jerusalem. But, please hear me, when Jesus uses the term Gehenna, or hell, it is a warning about the end. It is not just a warning about some t judgment soon to come, but a warning about the judgment that when it comes is going to be the end of the age and the final judgment. All right, the second thing Jesus believes about hell is that hell will mean eternal torment. I want to talk for a minute about this term hell and where it comes from. In the Old Testament, you see there is no real description of hell. And that's a very interesting thought. There is in the Old Testament the term Sheol, which is not really hell, that is really the grave, the realm of the dead. Wicked dead, righteous dead, doesn't really matter, it's just the realm of the dead. But the term Jesus uses is the word, I mentioned it a moment ago, the word Gehenna. And most scholars agree that this is a picture of eternal punishment that comes from a reference to the valley of Hinnom, or the son of Hinnom. Now that valley is on the southern slope of Jerusalem, and it is a place that became infamous during the Old Testament era 
because certain kings like Ahaz and Manasseh burned their children to false gods in the valley of the son of Hinnom. So when that happened, and I can show you the references for those, but we'll move on right now. But when that happened, later on prophets began to say that place became known for the fire in which they burned their children and coming judgment that was going to happen as punishment for what those kings had done. So uh, this is 2 Chronicles 28.3 that talks about they made offerings in the valley of the son of Hinnom and burned his sons as an offering. But this is Jeremiah 7 and verse 31. And they have built the high places of Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did it come into my mind. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when it will no more be called Topheth, or a valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. For they will bury in Topheth, because there is no room elsewhere. And the dead bodies of this people will be food for the birds of the air and for the beasts of the field, and none will frighten them away. So what you see happening here is the idea that this place... And the evil things that happen here that involve fire are now going to involve fire and destruction and judgment in the same place. And that seems to be the background of judgment and punishment that then begins to characterize this term Gehenna or hell. So what Jesus does is take that term Gehenna or hell and say this is what is meant by judgment coming now is a place where there will be final, eternal torment for people who are evil and refuse to respond to God. This is the judgment that is coming. Let's look at Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, I'll show you how Jesus uses this term. We're going to look at several passages pretty quickly here uh, and just kind of get the background for how Jesus uses this term. Mark chapter 9 and verse 42 it says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. So if we continue to sin and we refuse to make changes necessary to stop sinning, which Jesus talks about, you know, something's causing you to sin and you won't get rid of it, even if it's a part of your body. Then he says, the people who refuse to sin will go to hell. I refuse to stop sinning will go to hell. And there he describes it in this way. Their worm does not die, verse 48, and the fire is not quenched. So when I say eternal torment, this is the picture Jesus is drawing. Their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. There will be torment that goes on. So this is, by the way, a reference to Isaiah where it says the same thing as a penalty, as a judgment. And here he says that's what hell will be. The judgment that is coming is going to be punishment like that. Now you see what Jesus is doing. He's not just saying, let me share some facts about hell. He's saying, don't go there. Do what it takes to stay away from there because it would be better for you to hurt something in yourself, to take something away that's important to you, than to go to this place of eternal torment. Let's go to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. <clears throat> Matthew 25 describes the sheep and the goats separation. In Matthew 25 and verse 41, it says, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And then down in verse 46, And these, he says, will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. They will go into the eternal fire, he says, that is prepared for the devil and his angels. But notice also that the eternal punishment in verse 46 is just as long as the eternal life that we hope for in verse 46. So when I say eternal torment, that's where that comes from. It's important to note that hell is described here as separation from God. God and his people go into eternal life. The devil and his people go into eternal punishment or torment. All the evil and all the pain that Satan has caused, now he appears to be continuing to suffer with the people who followed him. Let's go to Luke chapter 16. Luke 16.
This is a story Jesus tells about the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus was a beggar who begged outside the gate of the rich man, and now they both die, and now they are taken to different kinds of places in terms of uh, how they experience the afterlife. Luke chapter 16 and verse 22. It says, The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried, and being in Hades, and in Hades being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. So you have the idea here of flame and of torment. And he says, I want to send others to warn my brothers, lest they also come to this place of torment. So the rich man appears to be conscious. He's aware, and yet he is in torment. He knows why he is here. And yet there's nothing he can do to change it. In fact, Abraham specifically says, nobody passes through the great gulf between these two places. So that's not an option. This is hell. Hell is eternal torment. And let's go to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew 10 and verse 28. Matthew 10 and verse 28. Jesus says, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So don't fear those who all they can do is kill your body. He says people have a limit to what they can do to us, but God is the one we fear because God is the one who can do far more than harm our bodies. He can destroy soul and body in hell. Now that word in verse 28 is an interesting word. Jesus uses the word destroy, soul and body in hell. And so some have seized on that. They combined it with some other places like Paul in his wording in 2 Thessalonians 1 to say that what hell really is is just destruction. God just um, annihilates a person so that they no longer exist, and that's what eternal punishment is. I don't deny that's a possibility, but to me, I have a hard time squaring the idea of annihilation with all the terms Jesus uses to describe torment. Over and over again, weeping and gnashing of teeth in the darkness, uh, the torment that the, the rich man is in, and all of these things to me signal that this is something that people are aware of, and yet they continue to experience it. Jesus tells us, this is a place you want to avoid with everything you can. I want to stress again, these are Jesus' words. These are red letters. These are words that we pay attention to in other contexts. These are words that you have taken and you've put on your refrigerator. These are words that we have taken and we say, you know what, that verse really helped me. And here Jesus is saying things that we all find extremely unpleasant. It's important for us to see that these things are just as true as all the other things Jesus teaches. And because of that, it should add an urgency to us. I want to talk a little bit about this idea, that hell is a necessary aspect of God's judgment. Hell is a tough teaching. And one of the reasons it's difficult is because there are some philosophical objections that it raises. How this is good, how this is fair, how this is just. And I want to think about that with you for just a moment. Look with me in Matthew 10 and verse 14. In Matthew 10 and verse 14, Jesus says, If anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. So, when people reject Jesus and they reject the words of Jesus and the message of Jesus, what else can be done? I mean, what else can God do? God has already had the patience while we lived in our sin to not just punish us then, but instead he sends on a mission men who are there to preach good news of how God was willing to save us from our sins. And yet when we reject them, what more can we do? See, even Sodom didn't have that opportunity. And Jesus says, it will be better for Sodom in the day of judgment than for people who continually reject God. Turn the page to Matthew 11. In Matthew 11 and verse 20. 
Matthew 11 and verse 20, Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. So what more can God do than to do these mighty works and try to reach these people? Sin must still be punished. And now they have added rebellion to their sin. So the idea of hell is the idea simply that God will allow people to suffer the wages of their own choices, the end result of what they have chosen. And God must allow that to be a judge of the world. Now, our objection to hell, the objection that is both a rational objection and an emotional objection, is that it seems like overkill. It seems like too much punishment for what appears to be rather minor offenses. And see, part of the problem here, it seems to me, is that we really need a better acquaintance with the Bible's teaching about sin. Sin is not to be pictured in the Bible like a set of numbers that God just erases, you know, and so you write it on the board and he just erases it. You get the old chalkboard and you start marking things and God just erases it. That's not the way sin is portrayed in Scripture. Sin is portrayed like conceiving a baby that when is full grown brings death. Or sin is like sowing a seed that will inevitably be reaped. Or sin is like putting on chains that then you are powerless to take off. Sin brings death. Hell is the death. That's the whole point. We are experiencing the consequences of our own actions. But really, when we say we have trouble with hell, what we are saying is that we just kind of have trouble with the idea of God judging and condemning. And we really think it would be okay for God to judge and condemn as long as it seemed fair to us. And I just want to point out that that becomes hopelessly Subjective. Can I give you an example? Do you remember the rich man and Lazarus? All Jesus tells us of that story is the rich man fared sumptuously every day. He always ate well, and there was a beggar at his gate. He never fed him, never helped him. And then they both die, and the rich man appears to go to hell because he didn't help the poor man. Does that seem fair to you? Do you know what? If we were to take a poll, I suspect that most rich people would say, no, that doesn't seem fair. And most poor people would say, yes, it does. You see, it would, it would be impacted by our own view of what's really a big sin and worthy of this punishment and what's not. It would become hopelessly subjective. You see, the problem is that the reality of hell is not changed by how we feel about it. God has this right because he is God. In fact, I would say it's necessary for God to be able to bring justice to the universe. God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And for that to be true, there must be some repayment. But the truth is that everybody is hoping for a justice to come in this world. It's just that we want that justice to come in the way that we like. See, none of us have a problem with the idea of Hitler. Hell doesn't trouble us for Hitler. That would be fine. He deserves it. What troubles us is when there are people that we feel are good or at least decent, and it just seems unfair. And here is the problem. Here's the rub. If God is going to decide who is lost and who is saved based on what we think, then we are God. We have become the judge. I think we know that that's not right. It seems to me that we need to allow God to be God. And instead of criticizing him for the way he chooses to dole out fates, be a little more humble and submit to him. And be sure that we're going to be on the right side of that judgment. Hell is not to be lamented. Hell is to be avoided. That's the focus. 
So, Jesus also teaches about hell, and this is how I want us to close this morning, that hell gives perspective on everyday decisions. When Jesus talks about hell, almost always, it is with the tone of this is a wake-up call morally for us. That we need to think about the fact that our decisions matter and that they're going to have an impact that's far beyond what happens today or tomorrow or next week or next year. That our decisions that we make on our everyday life are going to matter in eternity. And the question that Jesus wants us to ask is, is this worth hell? Is it worth it? So, I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So you and I are going to get angry. It might happen today, right? There are going to be people that make us angry. Will we allow that to fester? Will we resolve the conflict? Will we call them ugly names? We have these choices about what we're going to do with our anger today. And hell gives perspective. It reminds us there's going to be a day, it's probably tomorrow, when all those emotions have kind of died down. I'm going to feel differently. And what's going to matter to me then? So I'm going to feel today a rush to zing my brother. Say that ugly thing I've been waiting to say. I can fight for my own rightness. But what happens then? What happens after that? Is this worth hell? This little conflict, this little flare-up. Hell gives context. It gives perspective for everyday decisions. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Very regularly, we make excuses for our behavior. Even when we know it's wrong, we make excuses for it. We have people in our lives who we know contribute to our sin, lead us to sin, encourage us in sin. We have tendencies and temptations, and we know we could cut some of those things out of our lives if we chose, but we don't always want to. It might be painful. It might be awkward. Hell helps us because it helps us count the cost, and it just asks the question, is it worth hell? Am I really prepared to make excuses for what I do to the point that I will suffer eternally to do these evil things? Matthew 10, 28. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. We all have people who have weight in our lives. That is, we respect their opinions and we want their approval. We all have those people. And sometimes that desire to gain people's approval can contribute to how we act. It influences our behavior. And hell says, who should I really be afraid of? Who should really have an impact on the way I act? Is it some person or is it God? What happens when all the people around me are silent and all their respect goes away? All the kind things they say about me suddenly don't matter anymore, and I stand before God. Which one of these should I allow to influence me? Hell gives me perspective. The rich man has Lazarus at his gate. He has the ability to help him. He knows that he's there. He just does nothing. And that may seem sad to us, but it's more than sad. See, hell helps that have the correct dimensions in our minds. The question is, is my selfishness and my comfort worth hell? And suddenly there is clarity. Suddenly I realize it's not just sad that somebody is a beggar, but it's something that I must change. I need to notice. I need to care. I need to help. If anything will prompt us to act and get us out of our comfort bubble, wouldn't it be the teaching that we're going to go to hell if we don't obey God in these everyday situations? Several of the stories Jesus tells are about how we wait for the judgment. How are we waiting? Are we prepared? Do we treat our fellow servants well? Do we use the gifts God has given? Do we minister those gifts to other people? And we do what we would do to Jesus to them. And it's these stories 
that at the end of them, Jesus continues to say, for those who are not ready, we talked about one of them in the Peter class this morning, those who are not ready, those who treat their fellow servants poorly and try to take advantage of God, are the ones who are no longer pleasing to Him. Hell gives us perspective. How am I living right now? So, I don't want you to leave a lesson like this. Just feeling like we've had to have an unpleasant morning. I know this isn't anybody's favorite topic. I want you to leave with that clarity. That we're all going to stand before God in judgment. And that the everyday decisions we make matter in that judgment. I understand that this is scary. I believe it is intended to be scary. Because that fear can motivate us. And sometimes we need to be woken up. Sometimes we go through life without thinking about the decisions that we're making and the direction that we're heading. But I want to remind you, God sent his son to save us from this fate. Jesus went to the cross so that we don't have to go to hell, so that we can have eternal life, so that we can have the blessing of knowing God forever. So, this is what we are saved from. And God loved us enough to say, I'm not going to let them suffer this fate. I will intervene, and I will send my son. And I want you to know, if thinking about these things is troubling to you, if there are things that you need to change, don't wait and put that off. Let this be the moment that you say, I want to follow the God who loves me that much. And if there's something that you need to make right, use this moment and say, I want to leave behind the things that are standing between me and God. And I want to be right with God. And I want to be a faithful servant of God. So if this morning you're ready to be baptized into Christ, have your sins washed away so that you have a new hope of eternal life with Him, or if there's a need that we can help you with this morning, please come to the front right now as we stand and sing.